teaching my children as I walk through life, um, as I interact with people, that my my kids would learn from me about what the scriptures say through everyday life and conversations and not to just depend on on the church or mm-hmm. the youth group. Your dad, Sal, would just be like, Jeremiah, go in there and prepare a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't just think about what you uh, did wrong. Write a sermon about it and process it. <laughs> yeah. And it makes it more embarrassing when you repeat that mistake and I have to do the same sermon over again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think it's important, like, as we talk about doctrine, to recognize the sovereignty of God in the situation because we can get really frustrated. As Charles Spurgeon said, was that the sovereignty of God is the pillow that the believer rests his head on. And so as we're doing this, we can't think it's all on us. Our job is to be truth bearers. We're to bear the truth and the sovereignty, and we trust in the sovereignty of God. And so I think that it's very comforting when I can look at these data points and I can get very stressed out. But if I just say, hey, my job is to bear the truth, the Holy Spirit's job is the rest. That's that's a comforting thought just for those of you who are listening and thinking, man, I'm stressed out about my kids or other stuff like that. You just got to do your job. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Did you go over this already? Um, uh, talking about what the scripture says as far as commanding us mm-hmm. to know doctrine. Uh, do you want to go over that? I think that would be, okay. be better. You prepared this. The apostle Peter, second Peter chapter one, verses five. Um, through eight, but I'm just going to reach verse five for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. This verse is, it's powerful and it's important because the apostle Peter is commanding the reader to make every effort to supplement your knowledge. And that flies in the face of people who say, you know, doctrine kills churches or doctrine killed my church. My response to that is if doctrine killed your church, your church was already dead because Christ's sheep hear his voice and they follow him. But this, yeah, this verse is powerful as people, as the growing anti-intellectualism in the church gains more traction. This verse just it grounds grounds me and everybody else who is against it. Yeah, that the uh, and and the outcome of that, and because I've just observed this, I've been a part of it. Um, if I'm honest, um, the anti ex, what do you call it? The anti intellectualism um, movement is really about having an experience, right? Yeah. So we go to church to have an experience that God wants us. God wants to meet you where you're at emotionally, not only, and physically, and you know, and and that is true. God does want to meet you where where you're at, but, Mm -hmm. um, God doesn't cater to us. You know, God is bringing us to himself. And so that anti, um, intellectual, um, the tongue twister. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And so I think it was, what is encouraging because I I'm noticing, um, you know, another movement that is slowly gaining traction, um, are, are a lot of people being brought back to the doctrines and it's probably because, probably because I, I run more in the reformed uh, circles as far as the things that I w- listen to and watch. And I am seeing a lot of young people mm-hmm. and uh, older people fall in love with doctrine, with the emphasis of loving their savior Mm-hmm. and glorifying their God. Mm-hmm. And uh, especially this year, there's been a lot of education out there on trying to get people to know the foundations of their faith with this, with a celebrating 500 years since the Reformation with the five solas, you know, those basic essentials of our yeah. faith that the reformers thought we cannot compromise on these things. Like this is what makes our faith biblical and what it is. And people are beginning to to recognize those things, but it will put a dividing line in the sand of going, 
you know, what are we after? Are we after, are, are we serving or worshiping our emotions or experience mm. or are we desiring to get to know, um, the God of the scriptures and allowing that to form our, our worship and our emotional life. Mm-hmm. Um, I quote so many people. I should just act like I say this stuff, but yeah, just <laughs> John Piper says, uh, he says that the thought of emotionless religion is more scary than the thought of emotional religion. So it's not to say that emotion is bad exactly. or that it's plaguing it, but you have the way you feel is not telling you what is right and wrong. Truth is not subject to the way that you feel. Truth is external to your feelings and your heart. And that needs to be kept in view as opposed yeah. to, I feel like this. I feel like that. And that, as that, that postmodern uh, modernism really reaching its way into the Christian mindset. Um, you know, well, if I were God, I wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Or that that sounds like a mean God. A God wouldn't say no to that's someone. That's not there. fair. It's not fair. Mm-hmm. It's really it's the the voice of the age, or, you know, that is just creeped into the church, and it the world is influencing how we view ourselves as Christians in the scriptures, rather than a, us just saying, "God, your will be done." Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you had you had Second Timothy two fifteen. Um, here that says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's uh, for the preacher, for me and you or anybody else that has to teach the word. That is a scary verse that we are tasked with rightly handling the word of truth. Yeah. And not only for people who preach the word, but if you represent the word to your kids, you represent the word to anybody, your peers. If you're the Paul, Paul says we're walking epistles, and this is this puts the pressure on us to know what we're talking about, represent God right, and you can't be running around talking about I feel like this, I feel like that, because yeah. that's not it's not the way it's supposed to be. So allowing the scriptures to, um, define us in our lives. Um, I think that would be a really good place to kind of, cause we have a couple minutes here left on this episode. Um, where does that application come in as far as applying doctrine, um, to our lives? So if there maybe are some young Christians out there or old Christians out there going, wow, you know, I'm inspired to get into the word and figure out what God has for my life based on the scriptures, not only based on what the preacher is saying on Sunday mm-hmm. morning. Um, and they're going, you know, what do I do with that information? Um, mm-hmm. how do, where does doctrine and application connect? Um, because sometimes they just think, well, I have to be an intellectual giant. I have to be a theologian. I'm not as smart as those guys. And yet any time somebody is seeks or searching the scriptures out, seeking truth, they are, they are studying doctrine and they are doing the work of a theologian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the application should stem through one, your love for God two because we're commanded to, and three, because you are being a representative, representative of God. Um, like Moses, Moses misrepresented God one time and that was it. That was it for him. And the verse that really pops into my mind when I, when I hear the application of doctrine is Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, where it says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And that's where the application comes in is your zeal is to be according to the knowledge of God and and submitting those things to God's truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where you find your faith becoming exciting 
is where you go, God, what do you have for me? Like, as I obey you, you're really trusting in faith that God knows what is righteous. That when God says, hey, this is what I want for your life, according to the scriptures, um, it becomes exciting to live a life of faith and going, Lord, I'm trusting you for this in my life. And then you see God come through, um, not just running from highs and lows based on your emotional um, whims, but to go, um, God, I see it in your truth. And here I am, I'm going to live, live on it and stand, Mm -hmm. um, on it. And zeal without doctrine is like a sword in the hands of a lunatic. So if you don't apply that doctrine and like you said, to submit to God, what God says, it's, it's like putting a sword in the hands of a lunatic. It's dangerous, and as we can see, it's started up a lot of things. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, I mean, prosperity gospel doctrine is important. Exactly. It's the, I mean, it is our faith. It's the manifestation of God's face. So... Well, cool. We got, we got one more minute left on this episode. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find the proper music. And I think, I I, I think I found it right here. Captive portal. There we go. There it is. All right. That concludes another episode of the three M podcast. And with that, with 41 seconds left, I'm going to do a quick last words first thoughts and so jeremiah your first thoughts on the last words this is the last words of douglas fairbanks before he died he said i've never felt better (laughs) that's awesome that's a that's a tough guy right there (laughs) that's right he's going this is the best day of my life was he saved yeah i don't know I'll be honest. I'm not even sure sure who that is. If he wasn't, he wouldn't feel good for long. (laughs) (laughs) All right, everyone. We'll see you on the next episode.